All right, everyone, how are you doing today? Pretty good. That's good. Good. So we're a little light. We're going to wait for a few people, uh, more people to show up. Yeah. Chris, did you have a question? Oh, uh, no. Okay. Uh, we've got 11. Well, yeah, yes, I, but I can, can ask you later. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Ken, I've done that. Um, all right. Maybe we will start now. Let me... Um, Whoa, it's trippy, man. Oh, that's the best. Okay, I'm wondering how I'm going to do this. I actually forgot to change my name. That's all right. Yeah, I got your last name, um, Ashley. It's no problem. Okay, so... Whoops. I um, assigned the final project... I just want to go over it with you guys. So first draft is due May 10th, right? You have, a, you have an assignment that's due next week. And then you've got, I believe, uh, three weeks after that for the first draft. And then the final is due two weeks after that. So basically, there's going to be um, some... There's going to be some stuff um, on the final that we haven't learned yet, that we're going to be learning, and you're going to be utilizing it in your final project. So don't, don't worry about that. So for graduate students, we're going to do a re you're going to do a, what's called a remix, and I'm going to explain that. You're going to take any song in the final materials folder and do a complete remix around four minutes long if you wish to mash up two or more songs into one piece, that's fine. I want to see a great track, make music. And then I want to see edits to transform the performance of the audio track into a unique track. Elastic Audio, which we went over a little bit last week and we'll go over more. 10 MIDI tracks. And basically what you're going to do for graduate students is you're going to take the audio as if it was a, a standard tune and you're going to write an arrangement around it, except you're going to add that you're going to process the final, that audio to make it a little bit different. And you, um, this might sound a little obscure, but you'll see what I mean. So undergraduate students, you can, you can use any of that stuff for the graduate students, but I've also got a folder that's got easier stuff for you to play around with and you'll be doing the similar kind of work. So uh, there'll be six audio tracks and four instrument tracks. If you decide to use um, the stuff for the graduate students, I may adjust that down so it's only two audio tr tracks because it's more involved. Or you can do an arrangement of, um, and, and your track will be about two minutes long, or you could do an arrangement of the Bach A minor two-part invention for 10 instrument tracks, which I have the PDF for that. All right, so... Last bit, all these projects should be well mixed with panning automation and everything else we have or will go over this semester. And we'll be doing that stuff. So let's, let's take a listen. So in the undergraduate remix um, folder, I've got these, right, these audio files and all the ones with this, these all should fit together. Right. You can hear they're all in the same key, same tempo. And we'll go over, you know, ne next week I'll start to show you how to do some of this stuff. And if you want to do the Bach A minor invention, here's the PDF for that. And then uh, graduate students, we're going to have some fun. And undergraduates, you can, you know, take your stab at this too. But I've got stuff here that's copywritten and it'll get my video on YouTube block. But basically, I've got the a cappella for Because by the Beatles, just the vocals. I've got uh, 
Find Me Somebody to Love by Queen, just the vocals. I've got here come just these are if I play these exposed, they'll get blocked. I've got stuff that we heard before, the Stevie Wonder Higher Ground vocal, Marvin and Tammy. And then I've got uh, Radiohead, the song Nude. These are all the stems from Radiohead. And in our next class, I'll show how to start working on this stuff. But what I wanted to do here, because we've got a lot of stuff to go over today, is I wanted to play you some of the finals that some of the other students did. Um, and then I've got here... links for some really good professional remixes that you can check out to get some ideas from. So this is uh, Glauco Lima. This was about, he was a graduate student about three years ago. We'll take a listen to his track. And he did all this with with us uh, with uh, expand two. Here comes the sun. It's all right. Here comes the sun. Here comes the sun. It's been a long cold. So these are all for you to listen to, right? Um, this is another student, Ryoju. I forget his last name. This is, he did uh, Ain't No Mountain High Enough remix. Listen, baby. Listen, oh, sorry, that's my fault. I apologize. So I'm not going to play all of these, just playing, you know, little snippets of them so we can get on with the class. But just to give you some ideas, this is Alan Bogosian. He was a, um, he he had a, he already had a bachelor's degree and he got an MAP uh, certificate from us. So he was, wasn't a graduate student, but he was beyond, you know, he was above, uh, he already had his bachelor's degree. So he was a good student also. I'm sorry, I keep on touching the mouse and it goes back to the beginning. Get my hands off of it.
So that's another one. And this is uh, Anna Whitaker. She graduated two or three years ago. She was one of my best students ever and like an incredibly talented vocalist and she plays keyboards well. Um, so this is her version of the Radiohead song. Anyway, it's, that's really interesting. And then this uh, Tom Lee, you guys know him. He works in the office um, now. He took he took quite a few of my classes. He, this is Radiohead and Queen mashup together. Oh, with little Beatles too. Anyway, that's it. That's that's one of the more interesting ones. Uh, it's got the dr the drums from the Radiohead, which have nothing to do with the Queen, it, it, you know. And he's got them working, and then he's got sort of occasional other bits from Radiohead in with the vocals from Queen. So that was pretty interesting uh, to me. Um, so that's just some ideas on the kinds of things that you can do. What I would say is that. Um, there's an assignment due next week. Just work on that, but maybe download the material and take a listen to what's there. Um, we'll start, you know, we'll get into more strategies for doing this starting next week. This is up on our class stream uh, on a Google Classroom, this material and everything. So I just wanted to introduce that to you today. 
uh, let's see, are there any any questions, observations? I mean, you know, you, you're pretty much free to do whatever you want with this, whatever you've learned and whatever you will learn over the next five or six weeks, you know. Um, yeah, we're going to be working a bit, bit on manipulating audio. We're going to do some work on mixing. We're going to learn how to send um, audio to reverb tracks, and we're going to do a little bit of work on automation of plugins. So those are the kinds of topics that we've got for the rest of the semester and uh, how to set up a mix properly. No questions? And you guys are stunned? You're like in disbelief at what those former students did and you're wondering how you can up that game? <laughs> how you can one-up them? It's, you know, it's funny because I used to, I used to, I used to assign this thing where I would give you four, the students four pitches and they had to create a, an entire composition based on those four pitches. Like, you know, a D, F, E flat, and B, or something like that. And, and that was okay. But I found that this assignment is, once I started doing this, I started seeing much more creative uh, results from the students, you know, because they started doing like you know start doing stuff that i wouldn't think about with the music with these audio files to make them fit right and um some interesting stuff uh, you know some people don't really do well with this but overall people do people get get this done well and i'm usually very happy with the results all right so last week we got into um dealing with audio and today's going to be going forward for the rest of the class is going to be sort of like a history lesson um, and uh, I'm going to employ my friend Ken here who's been auditing our class to um, let's see yeah how am I going to do this and stream this without it being crazy on um, Let me just think about this for a second. All right. So anyway, you can spotlight his video and your. No, I understand how to do that. That's not the problem. It's um... all right. Ken, you're sharing your screen right now. Okay, hold on a second. So, Ken, uh, unmute. Hello, hello. All right, so everybody should pin Ken's screen, and I'm going to unpin myself. Oh, that works well. Great. So I can have Ken here. And then that'll, that's, so that, that's looking uh, like it's going out over YouTube well. Great. Okay, so we'll be able to do this. So um, Ken is going to do a little presentation. For those of you that don't know, Ken... And I have known each other since the late 1980s. He was playing bass in a touring company of an Elvis Presley um, sort of a biographical show. And I assisted the orchestrator with some of the arrangements. And then after the show was over, Ken came back to New York because Ken is from Memphis, I believe, area. And... Um, he moved into New York and he started interning at a studio of a mutual friend of ours. Uh, and he learned how to, he learned how to be an audio engineer. And, you know, Ken's a little modest, but I will brag about Ken. Ken had, was Bob James's engineer, the jazz pianist for over 20 years, mixed, you know, engineered albums, mixed his live gigs, mixed foreplay. Um, he's been the front of the house engineer for years for the rock band Toto uh, we shared a, he'll talk about this, but we shared a, uh, we had two rooms in a larger space on West 49th street for a while. And, you know, Larry Carlton would stop by once in a while. Bob would stop by once in a while. He had Kenny Garrett up there playing once. He had, um, Dave Holland was over. Ken was working on one of his albums. Uh, we had Bashiri Johnson in recording some percussion. And so, you know, Ken's done a lot of work with a lot of, uh, really well-known musicians as an engineer. And so I thought that um, I would ask him 
to give us a brief history of audio, audio recording and uh, to talk about the analog side of things. And then I'll pick it up towards the end and talk more about the digital uh, side of things. So without any ado, uh, take it away, Ken. All righty. Is the uh, mic working? You guys hear me okay? Check, check. Cool. So Pete asked me to talk briefly about analog tape <laughs> in the history of analog recording. Uh, so I went through and I cherry picked some inventions that I found interesting. Charles Wheatstone was one of the earliest inventors to identify sound was transmitted by waves. He devised several inventions pertaining to sound. One of the earliest he called the enchanted lyre. It, was really, it wasn't really an instrument, but a sounding resonator hung by a steel wire from the ceiling. The other end of the wire was connected to a piano sounding board in another room. When somebody played the piano, the sound vibrations were transferred down the wire, which resonated the hanging box. When he first demonstrated his device, he hung it in the music store. The customers were amazed by uh, an instrument that seemed to play by itself. And he was excited by this and began to imagine ways sound could be amplified and even transmitted. He was also the first to coin the term microphone. He experimented with bellows and developed a small accordion called the concertina. He worked on the first speech synthesis gadget, improving an invention by Wolfgang von Kempelen he called the speaking machine. And I have a diagram that shows how it works. Uh, it had bellows that you would press with your elbow of your right hand, and then you would use your right hand to press all these levers to make different tones. And the sound would come out where your left hand is, and you would squeeze this kind of uh, leather pouch and like opening and closing your mouth. And you could make all sorts of tones that sounded like talking. So I have an example of it. Let's take a listen to it. You can almost hear it breathing. Uh, other inventions he patented were the stereoscope, which is a device that lets you see images in 3D. Um, and a resistor circuit he called the Wheatstone Bridge that's still in use in many types of metering today. In 1857, Edouard Leon Scott de Martinville invented the phone autograph, a mechanical device which allowed him to record sound waves as an image. He originally designed it to emulate the eardrum and to imprint what the ear hears. He was hoping to visually read the inscribed waveforms like text. Of course, he couldn't read the waveforms and had no other way to replay the drawings, but he was credited with the first audio recording. It worked by funneling sound waves to a membrane whose diaphragm would vibrate a stiff bristle brush and press on a rotating cylinder of paper or glass covered in lamp black, which would inscribe an image. And here's what they look like. This was the first waveforms, the original oscilloscope. In 2008, scientists were finally able to decode the waveforms with a computer and play them back. Their first attempt at playing, uh, their first attempt played at the wrong speed, so they wondered who the mystery woman was singing. It was actually him. Fortunately, he had recorded a tuning fork on one of his tests, and the scientists were able to use the tone to adjust the speed. 
Here's one of the last recordings he made. Next is Alexander Graham Bell, who in 1876 invented the telephone, while Crontrack invented a better telegraph. He and his assistant, Thomas Watson, were working to develop a telegraph that could broadcast on three separate frequencies called the harmonic telegraph. In theory, this would allow someone to make multiple transmissions on a single wire. After many failed attempts, Alexander decided to spend his time developing a device to transmit the human voice. Bell made crude drawings, but didn't have the skills to facilitate his designs. Watson, who was an electrical engineer, helped create the prototypes. In 1876, he patented the telephone. The first words ever transmitted were, Mr. Watson, come here. I want to see you. In 1877, Emil Berliner came up with the carbon button microphone he called the loose transmitter. Bell was so impressed with the carbon button he bought the rights from Berliner for $50,000, over a million dollars in today's money, so he could use it for telephone prototypes. The carbon button microphone consists of a canister with a thin metal front membrane, a solid metal rear, and a button in between, a carbon, uh, I'm sorry, and carbon in between. As the front membrane vibrates, the resistance of the carbon is changed and by passing a constant electrical signal through the plates, he got a modulated electrical signal. This simple design was used in telephone systems until the 1980s. There were, dis uh, let's see, sorry. These discoveries led to the beginning of radio broadcasts, sound reinforcement and sound uh, reproduction as we know it today. Sorry, let me get a drink of water. Bell's father, Alexander Melville Bell, was a linguist who centered on deaf education, and his mother was almost completely deaf. During his career, Bell's father invented a symbol-based system to help the deaf learn to speak, which he called visual speech. He could recreate sounds by using symbols. At a demonstration, he went into another room and had an audience member make random sounds his assistant would write down the symbols representing the sounds and he would recreate them without ever hearing them. Any noise could be recreated. Words, burps, laughs, they even made fart noises which he mimicked easily by interpreting the signals, symbols. Alexander, like his father, spent his early years working with the deaf and during that time developed techniques to teach the deaf to talk and read lips. He eventually founded the Alexander Graham Bell Foundation to advance his teachings for the deaf. Thomas Edison was one of the most prolific inventors in modern history with over a thousand patents to his name. His inventions included the incandescent light bulb, the electric generator, motion picture camera, and alkaline batteries. In 1877, he invented the ten foil phonograph. Edison's phonograph used a needle that would cut vertical grooves into a ten foil cylinder. The louder or more bass heavy the signal, the deeper the cut. Here's one of the original recordings. Tin foil was very easy to damage and the fidelity was poor and the sheets had to be removed from the cylinder to change recordings. Bell improved the design by using wax cylinders instead of tin. 
The wax cylinders etched the wax instead of making dents. They were more durable, easy to change, and had higher fidelity than the tin foil. He called his device the graphophone. But there was an inherent problem with the graphophone and the tin foil recorder. Because of the heavy pressure, as the needle moved up and down, it was prone to wear out the recordings. Emil Berliner solved this by designing a disc player instead of a cylinder. The needle would move from side to side, allowing greater fidelity and use very little pressure on the disc. Because the discs were flat, they could be easily pressed instead of recording one by one, like the gramophone. Graphophone, sorry. As the telephone became more popular, Graham grew bored marketing it and running a telephone company, so he sold his stocks and moved on. With the money he made, he spent the rest of his life inventing and funding humanitarian causes. In 1881, when President James Garfield was shot, Bell was called in to help save him. The doctors couldn't locate the bullet, and within a few weeks, Bell was able to develop a magnetic bullet probe to help the surgeons find and remove the bullet, the first metal detector. Unfortunately, it was too late for Garfield, and he passed away. Next, he grew fascinated with flight and spent much of his time experimenting with kites and developing airplanes. During that period, he designed the first aileron, landing gear, and tail rudders. Then he became interested in speed, and on water especially, and invented the hydrofoil. In 1919, Bell set a world record of 71 miles an hour on water. When asked about his life, he said he only considered himself to be a teacher of the deaf, ignoring his legacy inventions. When he died, every telephone in the nation was silenced out of respect. All the recorders we discussed so far are mechanical recorders, which translate vibrations directly to the medium. But in 1898, Vladimir Paulson changed the record recording history when he invented the wire recorder. He uh, struck can out I just a piano wire. Can I just interject here for a second, Ken? What's that? Okay, let me just interject here for a second. So when he's talking about the medium, he means the wax cylinders or that uh, tin foil thing, all right? So that's the medium that he's talking about. Correct, yeah. Uh, so he strung out a piano wire and used a microphone connected to an electromagnet. By passing the magnet over the wire, it left a magnetic imprint of his voice. This was his working model, the telegraphone. Tel tel telegraphone. Telegraphone, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> How'd it work? A microphone was amplified, then connected to an electromagnet with a small air gap in between the poles. A steel wire was spooled past the air gap. The fluctuating electrical signal was converted to magnetic signal and imprinted on the wire. Steel holds an electrical charge well, so it was possible to replay the recording by converting the magnetic signal back to an electrical signal, amplifying it, and playing it through a speaker. The magnetic converter is called a transducer. Here's an example of the wire recorder. So yeah, that was, um, I think that was like a party. Somebody was recording their Christmas party or something and they were playing records in the background and they wanted to document this so they ran the wire recorder. So a transducer is a device that converts physical qualities to electrical qualities and vice versa. There are many types of transducers. transducers. They can convert sound, light, temperature, mass, and motion to electricity for measurement. 
Electromagnetic stringusers are incredibly important as they are the basis for all electric generators and electric motors. The transducers we use most in music are microphones and speakers. How do they work? The speaker frame has a permanently attached magnet which surrounds an electromagnet called a voice coil. As the electrical current reaches the voice coil, it changes the polarity of its magnet to either attract or repel itself from the magnet attached to the speaker. This causes the cone to move in and out, creating air pressure, which we call sound. Changes in air pressure. The dynamic microphone and speaker work using exactly the same principles, only in reverse. As a matter of fact, one of my favorite bass drum mics is a speaker from the Yamaha NS10. It's really just a very large diaphragm microphone and really good for recording sub frequencies. While we're talking about microphones, I wanted to mention another microphone technology called the condenser mic. The condenser mic uses a thin membrane called a diaphragm that's either metal or metal coated with an electrically charged metal backplate. When sound vibrates the membrane, it disturbs the magnetic field between the two and creates an electric signal. Condenser microphones require a battery or voltage from your mic preamp called phantom power. They're much more sensitive and easy to distort. So many mics will have a DB cut switch built in called a pad. The third type of mic is a ribbon mic. It uses a thin metal ribbon suspended between a U-shaped magnet. They have a very low output and need more amplification than other types of mics. Sound can be picked up from the front or back, but not the sides where it's rejected. You commonly place instruments you want to isolate either 90 degrees or 270 degrees off axis, and it does a good job at uh, not recording them. Besides the type of microphones, we also have microphone pickup patterns. So uh, let's see if you can see my mouse, yeah. So if you look at this, this image, this circle, the zero represents somebody standing, and this is an overhead view of the pickup pattern. So an omnidirectional microphone picks up sound in all, on all sides. This is our mic we were just talking about, the ribbon mic. And you can see it's got very good pickup in the front, very good pickup in the back, but the sides are totally null. The most common mic is a cardioid, and the cardioid mainly picks up from the front. This is a very natural sounding mic and is used a lot for uh, in the recording studio and for live sound. A tighter pattern mic is called a supercardioid, and it just knocks out more of the side, but it has a little lobe at the back. As you try to make your pattern tighter with a hypercardioid, you actually start turning more into a figure eight pattern. In 1924, Ludwig Blattner invented the big brother to the wire recorder called the Blattner phone. Blattner was a composer, film director, and ran a chain of cinemas in Manchester. He licensed a design from a worm, uh, German wire recorder inventor and designed a device that used steel tape instead of wire. Blattner originally intended the Blattner phone to be used as a system of recording and playback for talking pictures. But the BBC saw the potential to record and transmit radio programs. They used them for several years to rebroadcast events. Here's an example of what it sounds like. You have heard another edition of Canadian Calendar, where the events of the week as seen by London's Canadian eyes are presented and reviewed. So we're starting to get some better um, fidelity going. And in 1930, AEG, a German-based company, invented the first player that used magnetic particle tape, the magnetophone. It used a paper tape instead of metal and iron oxide particles that were bound using lacquer. 
This was the first practical tape recorder. And it allowed Hitler to broadcast speeches in locations far away as if he was at the event. This was the first recording on a magnetophone prototype. Over volume is fine, just move down. Let's have the tone down so it can fit by the, the, the amount louder than, than the than the recording. Ooh. Maybe here. I, well actually we're almost out of examples. So okay, okay. <laughs> Sorry. All right. about that. No problem. <laughs> All right. So uh, next is Bing Crosby. He wasn't an inventor, but had a major impact on the development of modern tape machines. By 1935, Bing Crosby was an early pioneer in music radio shows. He had a very popular show, but the schedule was growing too demanding for Bing to do a live broadcast once a week, mainly because he wanted to go broad. As things progressed, he was required to do the show twice, once for the East Coast and once for the West Coast. And by 1945, he was tired of his schedule and decided he wanted to pre-record the show so he could edit and broadcast at a later time. His first attempts using transcription discs were a total disaster. The sound quality wasn't near as good as the live broadcast that audiences used to, and editing was a nightmare. They would have several machines and record from one to another, losing quality each time, to try to assemble the show. Sometimes it would take 40 discs editing back and forth to make a final product. Around that time, Jack Mullen, had returned from his World War II Army service with parts of two German magnetophones that he had shipped back in mail sacks over several months. When Mullen returned to the United States, he and William Palmer started a recording and movie business. Palmer had a machine shop where they restored and modified the magnetophone. Mullen made new electronics using American parts, and he used AC bias to improve the tape signal to noise ratio. AC bias is an ultra high frequency above human hearing, usually about, I think about 150K, that's added to tape during the recording so it responds more linearly. linearly. Mullen began demonstrating the recorder, which was far better than any other recorders of the time. It sounded live and could be edited with scissors and scotch tape. Crosby's people heard the machines and were impressed, but there were only two machines in existence and about 50 tapes from Germany. They knew they had to find another answer. Mullen made an arrangement with Ranger Industries to share information so they could build their own magnetophones. They had planned to develop their own tape since the other tape formulas didn't work with the machine. Ranger developed his own tape recorder and the Crosby team invited Ranger and Mullen to record an, a show and compare the machines. Ranger's tape machines were nothing special and the magnetophone easily won. But after recording for a season, the tapes had so many edits, they had to transfer to discs for the broadcasts because they were afraid the tapes would break. The 1947-48 season was the first radio tape broadcast. After that season, new machines were invented by Ampex and tape formulas by 3M. Crosby needed the new machines for his next season, but Ampex didn't have the money to complete development. Ving gave Ampex $50,000 cash and a plain envelope so he could develop the machines, so they could develop the machines. Later, Crosby was awarded distributorship for Ampex tape and 3M tape machines for his donation and support. 
Les Paul was a virtuosic guitar player who invented the solid body electric guitar and also came up with a technique that changed recording forever, sound on sound recording or overdubbing. Early Les Paul recordings were recorded direct to disc using a cutting lathe. He developed a technique in which he would make a recording, play it back with a second turntable, play along and re-record to the original recording. In 1949, Bing Crosby gave Les one of his Ampex tape recorders, which he modified by adding another playback head before the record head, so he could listen to his recordings and add a new part on top. This was a, this was a destructive recording as he was adding on top of the original tape. Later, he acquired a second machine so he could keep the original and overdub from the second machine. He worked with Ampex to develop the first eight track recorder, a mixer with EQ, and created some of the tape effects we still use today, such as tape delay and flanging. Later machines improved and eventually led to the 24 track recorder. So we talked about the history. Let's talk briefly about how a tape machine works. The tape moves from left to right, starting with the supply reel, past the tape guide, and to the heads, then to a pinch roller and capstan, which control the tape speed. The capstan speed is controlled by an oscillator, which can be varied as needed. The take up reel that's always pulling lightly to keep the tape spooling. The supply reel has a motor pulling back slightly on the tape to keep the tension on the heads. If you watch a video of a tape machine as it runs out of tape, you'll notice the take up reel speeds up after it leaves the pinch roller, since it has nothing to regulate the speed. The take up reel guides as a motor off switch. So once the tape tension is released, it moves and shuts off the motors. Here's a close up of the record head. Modern tape is a plastic tape with a ferric oxide coating bound to it. During the manufacturing process, the tape is passed through a strong magnetic field to align the particles lengthwise before the binding sets in. When recording, a magnetic field stresses the particles and some are forced to align with the head gap. The stronger the field, the more particles are stressed until some point, all the particles are stressed, which causes distortion. When this happens, the tape can't take any more magnetism, and we see it's saturated. As recorders progress, we develop many formats. You couldn't just play a random tape without knowing the head format. Here are some examples of the different head configurations for a quarter inch tape. <laughs> Next, I'd like to talk about what it was like working in an analog studio and the role of an assistant engineer. The assistant engineer is a thankless job, but it's the backbone of any commercial recording studio. When the assistant arrives hours before anyone else, the entire place has to be cleaned and vacuumed. Floors, all the equipment, console faders, patch bay, as dust and smoke can damage sensitive equipment. What about, what about a T-boy, Ken? <laughs> What's yeah. a T-boy? Well, that's like in Abbey Road. That's the, fa the famous, if you read any of the history of Abbey Road, the way they teach their engineers is they'd have a person, a new person come in and sit, and all they would do for the first year is make tea for people. Oh, yeah. And watch. Yeah, that's, that's the intern's job. Yeah. <laughs> uh, next, you set up your routing, and you mo remove any unused cables in the patch bay. The patch bay is a switchboard of the studio. As a matter of fact, studios inherited them from telephone technology. Every piece of equipment, every input and output of the console, every track of the tape machine, and all the tie lines from the recording room terminate here. So the engineer can easily route signals and experiment with different devices without running cables. Here's a well-designed patch bay. You can see the color coding and layout make it easy to navigate and harder to mispatch. 
Next, you would normalize the console, making sure every button, knob, and fader were in a silent position or a neutral position or an off position so that no stray signals would pass, nor processor inserted by accident. Then the assistant would align the tape machine. This would take a long time since every channel had about a dozen adjustments. First, you clean and demagnetize the entire tape path. Next, the playback alignment, where you adjust the settings for the playback head. You would play a reference tape called an MRL, Magnetic Reference Laboratory, which would have tones recorded at a standardized level. You would then adjust the playback volume and EQ for each of the 24 tracks using a tiny screwdriver called a tweaker. Next, you would put a virgin reel of tape on the machine and do a record calibration. You would first adjust the input level and then put all the tracks into record and adjust the record level and EQ for the record head using a signal generator. After you aligned everything, you would record 30 seconds of each of the three calibration tones. So if you played the tape on another machine, you could recreate the levels and EQ. Soon the musicians would arrive and you'd set up all the mics, stands, DIs, and headphones and plug them in the live room patch panel into the studio. Can you go back one second, Ken? Can you go back one? So right here, you can see my mouse. I'm, I'm doing a big circle. There's this, this um, diffuser right here. Right below that, you see that? That's the, where everything gets plugged into. And from there, behind the walls, there's wiring that goes into the control room here. So you plug your microphones in here, and that's patched in to the control room, into the patch bay, and then in, routed into the signals into the mixing console. So that's right. what, that's what he was talking about with the uh, patch panel. Patch panel. We have one of those in room 206, 268, which is where we would normally be uh, when we do live recordings. Go ahead. Sorry, Ken. No problem. Once the engineer arrived, <laughs> you'd baby and do most of the work because he probably wouldn't be familiar with all the ins and outs of the gear and get and couldn't get them working correctly in your studio. You'd ask how he wanted the control room equipment hooked up and patch and test everything. You'd have to label every channel of the console so no one grabbed the wrong fader. Label the outboard equipment, get the engineer a cup of coffee, and start taking notes of everything so it could be recreated at a later date. During the session, you would document everything possible. If the engineer came back and things were different, he'd be angry. First, you had to make a track sheet that listed what was recorded on each track of the recorder. This is a Michael Jackson one. And during the, recorder, uh, during the recording, you would watch the tape counter and make cue sheets that listed the sections of the song so the engineer could find them easily. After the session, you would document all the equipment using recall sheets, which were drawings of the outboard gear you would document the console, document the patch bay, label up all the tapes, clean up the live room, and leave exhausted hours after everyone left. Thank God for Pro Tools. <laughs> all right. Thank you, Ken, so much. Appreciate it. Very well done. Very historic, uh, you know, accurate, really great histor historical doohickey. Uh, let me remove the pin and let me move this up here and let me pin myself. Great. Okay. So I'm going to switch cameras here and I want to show you that <clears throat> you guys are going to like, you're working all inside your computer now and, but a hybrid studio combines the best of both worlds. And what I would say is that it's, uh, you know, it's, it's very romantic to think, oh, I'm going to get a tape machine and because tape sound, everybody thinks the tape sounds so great. But then when you start thinking about all of the maintenance that you have to do on a daily basis to get a tape machine to sound right, the way it has to be biased, the way that everything has to, you have to know how to lay tones down and calibrate the machine and, 
and and you know like in a 24 track machine a couple of channels might decide not to work one day and then you know it just there's so many parts that can and often do malfunction at inopportune times that it's one of the, it's actually one of the reasons why there aren't that many big studios around because the repair co- what, what amongst many reasons but in my opinion there are repair costs and maintenance costs and the stuff just keeps on adding up 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 and what you know people can do stuff on laptops now but i'm going to switch cameras and i want to show you the like the brains of my studio here oh. there we go okay so i'm going to talk loud i'm not speaking into the mic anymore but basically um this is a rack and this is my power supply everything all the stuff is plugged into the back i have two patch bays the one on the top is for microphone inputs it's wired into my audio interfaces which is this and this is an expansion this is another patch bay that these things down here are patched into and also i've got a mixer patched into here with my synthesizers running into the mixer and this these are this is my audio my hd audio interface and then this is uh an eight channel expander for that this is my um i don't use this as often anymore since i got my new computer but this is where i've got my heart my my ssd drives uh removable s hot swappable ssd drives that i keep all my media on and then down here are some signal processors this is an api uh stereo eq this is a warm audio a bus compressor and then these are two uh, hybrid summit tube uh, solid state mic pre's that I use. The mic pre's on this red thing uh, by Focusrite are very good, but these have a great sound to them, so I, I can use that stuff. And then I'll move the camera, and then that's my computer right there, right? And then for our classes, that bit with the green lights down there, that's the audio interface I use. Uh, that right there for this class uh, because when I use the HD interface I can't get that to broadcast over Zoom or over um, YouTube or anything like that so I have to have a double a double uh, you know set of audio interfaces and then um, just to amplify on another thing that Ken spoke about and then those of you that took recording studio fundamentals have seen this and next semester in if you take audio midi 2 we'll talk about this but ken was talking about microphones so this is you've all seen this kind of a microphone and some of you probably own something like this or maybe it looks like this and it's got a ball on the end this is an sm57 this is the, like the probably the world's most used microphone um, it's a dynamic microphone um it's it's if I were to say that this is an incredibly sounding microphone, I would be lying. But this is an incredibly utilitarian, useful microphone, right? And it's it's used a lot for live performances because uh, these um, dynamic microphones are not very sensitive. In fact, you have to get really close to them in order to get a good sound, right? And then this microphone that I'm speaking into here, this is a condenser microphone. I don't really want to move that, but I'll show you another condenser microphone here. And um, this is, uh, let's see, let's get that in focus. There we go. This is a Neumann U184. Uh, and this is a small capsule diaphragm because the capsule right here with the membrane is small. It's the size of a dime. Right now, I will touch this. Let me move this up so you can see it. I'll take the windscreen off. Right, so this is a large diaphragm condenser microphone, and you can see the relative size difference between the capsules. Right, so this is bigger and this is smaller, and both of these are directional. So this is a con this is a cardioid. So if I start moving over here, you can hear that I get softer and softer and softer. And as I get into the front, I get and I'm talking directly into the capsule. You can really hear it much better. Um, I, I go over that. We go over that in Audio MIDI 2 in, in great detail and, and, and somewhat in Recording Studio Fundamentals. Those of you that took that last semester, we did go over that. So I just wanted to do a little adjunct add-on to Ken's excellent presentation. Um, I learned a few things there. So 
Now, a couple of things. that I, I want to I wanna, uh, point out is, do you see how long it took? It took basically from the late 1800s until about 1970, 71, 72, 73, somewhere around that period, to start with analog recording and to get to the zenith of analog recording, right? So in other words, the equipment that was made by the mid 1970s. I mean, Ken, if I'm if I'm speaking incorrectly, please correct me. But like, for example, the album Asia by Steely Dan. I believe that that was either in 76, 77, 75. That's considered to be one of the greatest engineered analog recordings of all time, right? And that's fifty, like 45 years old, and it still sounds amazing. And then once you get into the 1980s, you started having the advent of the Stony digital recorder. And then from there, it took maybe like 20 or 30 years, until 20 years until everybody's now using a vast majority of what you're hearing is digital recording. So in other words, it took maybe 80 or 90 years to get from the beginning, or maybe even more than that, maybe 100 years, to get from the beginning of creating and transmitting sounds and recording them via like in an analog way where you're taking waveforms and changing them into electricity to maybe like 40 years or so from to get digital recording from where it started being used to where it is now right so if you started like in the early 1980s with some some albums being recorded digitally. Uh, there was a Crosby, Stills, Nash album, which I believe was the first commercially released album that was completely recorded on digital. And um, and that was in the you know, early 80s, I believe. Uh, I don't know the exact, I should, I should know the time of that. But it's 40 years later, and right now we've advanced this, the art of digital recording where even... There's a there's a there's a guy named Al Schmidt. You don't you none of you only Ken knows who he is and maybe Mark Bonder, but um, you know Al Schmidt's one of the greatest recording engineers of the past fifty years, and you would think that a guy like that who's recorded you know everything would be a fiend for analog recording, and he, even he now prefers to record things digitally. I've read because it, because of the ease and because he feels like with the equipment and the technology available now that it's that it the this and and the way that everybody's kind of used to the sound um that it's 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 much superior for him on many levels that might outweigh any perceived sonic benefits of analog recording you know pete i haven't used uh analog tape in probably 20 years <laughs> yeah and you know ken um you know, uh, it, analog tape is, is interesting. We have this mutual friend named Larry, and I had gotten Larry a gig um, recording. Uh, there was a... Ted Turner produced this huge um, Civil War documentary, and I can't remember the name of it, about 20 years ago. And they recorded some of the score, some of the score here in New York. And a friend of ours, a mutual friend of ours named Larry... I got him, uh, I knew the music supervisor. I had worked for him on uh, on a few other things. So maybe this is like 19, this is 2003 or four, so 2002, three, four, somewhere around that time. So, you know, they recorded this on analog tape at this place called Sound on Sound Studios, which was in the West 40s. Uh, a really nice, uh, small, but really nice studio. And they recorded stuff that sounded like uh, Civil War era music, you know, with like authentic instruments and stuff. And they wanted there to be, uh, they wanted take one and take two and take three put together, right? But they wanted it to, they wanted it to not be done on the master on, after they mix it. They wanted it to be done to the 24 track tape so that they could add more instruments on top of that. So, you know, basically he, he had got a razor blade out and, you know, a, a grease pencil, and he marked his ins and outs on a little cutting board, and he chopped the tape up and spliced it together, 
you know, this this 24 track recording. And if he had made one mistake, you know, he could have ruined the whole thing. Unlike in Pro Tools, where that would take about 10 seconds to do, you know, and and be very stressless and non-destructive, right? So, you know, it's like it it it's the analog recording required a lot of physical ingenuity um, to make it work properly. Yeah, and there was no undo button once you hit that record light. Yeah, I remember that. Uh, yeah, I remember once being at a session where we were recording something, and um, we got we we played this thing, and uh, it it was like a great take, and the producer was happy, and the engineer pushed the play button but not the record button, and didn't catch catch it. You know, so stuff like that would happen. Yeah, Gaucho, that's an interesting story too. All right, so let's move let's move forward with our discussion. So in the analog like in the analog world, right, you're seeing like real things, right? That are that are that are like tangible. You know, if somebody draws a painting, right, that's somebody's hand with a brush dips it in paint and draws a stroke. Oh, thank you, Alan. Appreciate that. 79. Alan has some good information there. Um, right. You take your hand and you, and you stroke across the canvas or whatever your medium is, and there's a, a continuous line, a flow, right? But then within that, if you zoom in on that, right, you're going to see all these really beautiful, intricate patterns of the brush stroke. And it's the same with, with analog recording. There's, you know, it's, 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 th there's particles that are magnetized on tape in a certain way and they, and they're, you know, transferred into electricity and back out the speaker, which is the, an inverse of a microphone. Um, and, and it, but with digital, it's an illusion, right? So the first thing I want to do to you is I want to do sort of a, a, an, an, an analogy Okay. So this is a little film I took before class started down in the greenhouse, right? And so this is, let's play this. Now, that looks like a cont continuous movement to you, right? And con uh, but it's not. It's not continuous movement, right? It's 30 still images per second stacked up and played contiguously, one after the other. So let me show you what I mean. Now, if I hit the, uh, the right arrow key on my keyboard... I'm going one frame at a time, one picture at a time. And you could see how this is all moving. And this is actually what's happening. There are all these individual snapshots that are taken together. Well, they're taken and played one after the other. Right. So these are individual pictures and I can change. I can click slower and it'll move. You can. And you see how much motion there is between each picture. Look where my fingers are and see now how they've moved. Like between those two, right from this one, you can really see that there's quite a difference. But if I were to play it back at 30 frames per second. It looks smooth, like a continuous. Like a continuous sequence. That's because it's been determined through many years, right, that 24 frames per second and above will, the, the human eye detects that 
as continuous motion. So most films that you've seen throughout history have been recorded at 24 frames per second. Most television shows are recorded at 30 frames per second, or it's called 30, 30 drop. They've dropped one frame every minute or two, um, which has to do with color, uh, broadcasting color over the old airwaves. Um, but it's an, you're, you're looking at an illusion. You're looking at a bunch of still images that are, being, that are going by so fast that they look like a continuous sequence. Audio is the, the digital audio is the same thing. So what do I mean by that? Well, uh, let's let's take a. Um, let me go to. Uh, give me one second. Oh, wrong one. Here we go. Okay. The way audio is sampled, turned from an analog wave into a digital file, is that measurements are taken of the wave at regular intervals, basically saying what the position the wave is in at that point. Within a certain frequency C range, which is capped by the recording equipment at the relevant level, there is only one, one sine wave that can pass through the given points, right? So basically, you're sampling the audio, you're taking measurements of the position of an audio wave at a point in time, right? And that measurement is what's called a sample of the audio. And then one other thing to note here is there's something called the Nyquist theorem which says to re reproduce a frequency, the sample rate must be at least double that frequency. So, basically what you're doing is you're taking a snapshot of an audio waveform in time and you're stacking them one after the other. And the number of those, those are, so each one of those is a little slice of audio. The number of those slices in one second is called, does anybody know besides Ken? How about anybody that took Recording Studio Fundamentals last semester? The sample rate? Yep, sample rate. So the, there are the, the sample rate that you're most used to hearing is what's called 44.1K. That means in every second, there are 44,100 slices of audio that are playing back just like that. those still images were playing back at 30 per second. Now, think about that for, think about that for a minute, right? Your eyes can be fooled with 30 frames per second, but they've determined that, you know, and, and there are other reasons why, which I'll get into in a minute, why 44,100 was chosen. But in order to fool your ear, you need 44,100 slices per second. Now, um, can anybody think of why, why that's there based on something I just said? Uh, well, okay, Mark, I know you know. So, I, in this right here, to reproduce a given frequency, the sample rate must be double the frequency. So, it's generally thought of that humans can hear up to 20,000 hertz. I can hear at my age 14,000, you know, and after all the gigs I've done. Um, I, so I, I, and I've tested this with some of my younger students. They can hear things that I, high pitches that, uh, like a sine wave high pitches, high, a little higher than I can for sure. Um, so 44,100 is about twice higher than 20,000.
Now, there is this kind of theory that's like, for example, one of the things that people think about analog gear, why it sounds good, is that the, it has no cap on the frequencies or the overtones that a sound can produce. You can have overtones 80, 90,000 hertz. Obviously, only my dog can hear that. We can't hear that. But there are some people who feel that that has an effect on sounds that you hear in the audible range that you might have, you know, up to 20,000 hertz. I don't know if that's true or not, but I've read that in many articles that there are some people that feel that that's true. Um, yeah. So basically what happens is that a waveform, right, goes through in, in, um, in, in Ken's model, a waveform is picked up by a microphone. The microphone's a transducer, turns it into electricity. And then that electricity is turned into mag magnetized particles on a piece of tape. With digital audio, microphone, the electricity gets turned into digital numbers through something called a DAC, a digital, uh, an, an, a, a, an ADC, analog to digital converter, right? And then a DAC on the way out back to the speakers. So what that converter does is it basically takes a snapshot of the waveform in its position. And we're going to get into waveforms next week. Uh, we're going to spend a good portion of the class on waveforms. I have a whole whole bit set up for that, and that'll become a little bit more clear for you. So um, now, the next bit thing I want to talk about with this is that Yeah, let me, uh, I'm going to talk about, um, give me one second. I'm looking for something. One second. I thought I had this organized, but apparently not. Oh, I apologize profusely. Okay, so let's take a look at um, this. We're going to go back to photography for another uh, for another bit. So these are three circles, right? Does anybody know what DPI stands for? Oh, wait. Sorry. Thank you. I got it. I got it. I got it. Here we go. <laughs> All right. So here are three circles. The first one looks like a circle. The second one, if I zoom in, you could see it's a little rough around the edges. And the third one doesn't look smooth at all. So DPI stands for dots per inch. So the higher the number, the closer it looks to a round circle. Right? No, that's not the one I'm looking for. Give me one second. No, it's not that one. It's this one here. Okay. Great. Okay. Here we go. 
I'm going to play a little video here sound. for you guys. So this speaker was able to Check out this speaker. If we plug it in, it makes sound. The way this speaker creates sound is by moving the front of the speaker, which is called the diaphragm, back and forth rapidly. Scientists often use the word oscillation to refer to the back and forth motion of an object. This speaker's oscillating too fast for the human eye to see, but if I put a piece of paper on the speaker, we see that because the diaphragm is oscillating, it's bumping into this piece of paper and causing it to dance. The oscillation of the diaphragm will also cause the air in front of the diaphragm to move back and forth. But here's the interesting thing. The air in front of the diaphragm doesn't actually travel away from the speaker. The air molecules in front of the speaker just oscillate back and forth. So how can you hear the sound from a speaker if the air next to the speaker doesn't actually make it to your ear? Well, the reason is that the oscillating air in front of the speaker causes the air in front of it to also oscillate. This causes the air in front of that air to start oscillating, which causes the air in front of it to start to oscillate until finally the air that's actually next to your ear and your eardrum start to oscillate back and forth. That's kind of like the old telephone game that uh, kids in the 60s and 70s used to play. Uh, it's oscillating air that's next to your ear is moving so it has kinetic energy so it can transfer energy into your eardrum which you can perceive as sound so this speaker was able to transport energy through the air without actually having to transport the air itself this is an important enough fact for me to state again energy is traveling across the room here but air itself is not traveling across the room. Only the disturbance within the air is traveling across the room. If air were being transported across the room, it'd be better characterized not as sound, but as wind. So this is why we call sound a sound wave, because it shares the defining feature of waves, which is being able to transport energy through a medium without having to transport the medium itself. Medium is a fancy word for the material or substance through which a wave is traveling. Air is typically the medium for situations involving sound waves, but sound waves can travel through all kinds of different materials, like water, metal, or even human flesh and bone. And the fact that sound can travel through human flesh and bone explains something you might have always wondered about which is why do our voices sound so different on audio and video recordings? The reason for this is that when we're speaking to someone, we actually hear two contributions from our voice. We hear the sound wave traveling out of our mouth, through the air, and into our ear. But we also hear the vibration of the sound wave traveling through our flesh and bone, through our skull, and into our eardrum. But on an audio or video recording, the only part that's recorded is the sound that travels through the air. So when you hear your voice played back on an audio recording, you only hear what other people hear when they listen to you. So the bad news is that, yes, what you hear on audio recordings is actually what you sound like to other people. But the good news is that most of your friends probably don't think it sounds weird since that's the only voice they've ever heard you use. Unless you do actually have a weird voice. In which case, I'll risk sounding pretentious by reminding you that you shouldn't waste a lot of time worrying about what other people think of you anyways. <laughs>
The other type of wave is a transverse wave. Transverse waves happen when the wave velocity points perpendicular to the oscillations of the medium. Waves on a string or waves on the surface of water are examples of Sorry. transverse waves. If we look at a graph of the air displacement versus position of the air, we can see that as the wave travels, the shape of this wave travels to the right. So the speed of a sound wave can be found by finding the speed of the peaks or the speed of the valleys or the speed of any single point on the wave shape. To figure out a formula for the velocity of a sound wave, let's look closely at what's happening here. Watch one of the air molecules. It takes one period for this molecule to move back and forth through a full cycle. During this time, the wave shape has moved forward one complete wavelength. This is because the wave has to overlap with its initial shape after one period, because the molecule has to be back where it started after one period. Now since speed is defined to be the distance per time, the speed of a sound wave has to be the wavelength of the wave divided by the period of the wave. Since the wave is traveling forwards one wavelength per period, or since the frequency is defined to be one over the period, we can rewrite this formula as speed equals wavelength times frequency. This formula is accurate for all kinds of waves, not just sound waves, because a wave has to move one wavelength for every period. Be careful. When looking at this equation, you might think that if you adjust the setting on your speaker and increase the frequency, you'd also be increasing the speed of the sound wave. But that's not what happens. If you increase the frequency, the wavelength will decrease by that same factor, and the speed of the sound wave will remain the same. In fact, there's nothing you can do to the speaker that would increase the speed of sound. So how can we change the speed of sound? Well, the only way to change the speed of sound is to change the medium or the properties of the medium that the sound wave is traveling in. So to change the speed of sound in air, you can change things like the temperature of the air or the humidity of the air or the density of the air. Or you can swap out the air entirely for another material like water or helium or a metal. All of these changes to the medium would affect the speed of sound. People often think that changing the amplitude will change the speed of a sound wave, but it won't. If we create a sound pulse with a large amplitude, it won't travel any faster than a sound pulse with a small amplitude in the same medium it will just be louder. In other words, yelling won't cause anyone to hear you faster. They'll just hear a louder sound when the sound wave arrives at their location. So remember, the speed of a sound wave is determined entirely by the properties of the medium through which it's traveling. Okay, to change so, the speed of sound, um, you have let's to change stop this. So I let that last bit play because that'll tie into um, a, f a future lesson in for us uh, when I start talking about reverb, right? Because when let's say we're at the, the we're, let's say we're, this is normal times and we're at the college and we're in the atrium. The atrium is very hard to hear people speak because it's got a four and a half second. We measured it once, like a four and a half second reverb time for a not a very big space. But because it's got very high ceilings and it's a lot of glass on the ceiling, the roof, the ceiling, and everything, and that's because you're hearing all these echoes all over the place happen really quickly. Now, take for example, if you go into Lefrac Hall, and you're standing, you're standing on the stage, and someone's standing in the back, and they clap or hit a drum you're going to hear the direct sound pretty quickly, but you're going to hear reflected sound after the drum hit. And that's because it takes longer to travel because it's bouncing off of stuff before it gets to you, right? So um, in inside of computers, that stuff is all manipulated digitally. It's not actually bouncing off of walls that they have algorithms that that create all that stuff but the important thing for for us to understand is that we are working in digital audio in pro tools and that digital audio is comprised of samples and there are each one of those samples is a snapshot of a waveform at a particular point in its wave right 
It contains the amplitude and it contains the frequency. And that in, for, in our working method, we're using 44,100 of them every second. All right. So there's something else called bit depth, and I'll talk about that a little bit more next week. Um, I've been giving you guys like a ton of information. Now, the one other thing I wanted to talk about today uh, is that Pro to, like Ken was talking about analog tape studio and um, the way that it was set up and the way it worked. Um, the Pro Tools is set up to, to emulate an a 24 track or more studio. Um, hold on a second inside the computer, right? So it uses the, the, the 24 track studio power. So what do I mean by that? All right, so this is the edit window that we've been working in, right? And in this edit window, you could think of these as lanes on a tape deck. So each one of these could be a track on a tape machine. So, right, you've heard of like eight track machines, Four track machines, twenty four track machines. Well, well, the twenty four. I I think a twenty four track was the largest machine, and then when they went up to forty eight tracks, they would synchronize two machines together. Is that accurate, Ken? Yeah, that's that's pretty much it. Right. So they they synchronize two twenty four track machines together to get forty eight tracks, but. There's another view that we haven't been looking using too much called the mix view here. And this gives you sort of like a virtual representation of a mixing console, right? These are your faders. And then you've got your sends and your inserts. And if you look at, um, give me one second. Oh, wait, hold on. Okay, right. So this is a con. This is like a console, and you'll notice that up here these are meters for the levels of your tracks. Here's your faders, and then you've got these different areas here, and they've got uh, EQs in here. Some of these have compressors built into each one of these channel strips. They have sends to send to uh, to AUX tracks which we're going to discuss very soon. So this is sort of a representation of that, but instead of having, um, right, knobs, they have inserts where you can put in an EQ like this right here. And, um, right, so then this, in effect, does what those knobs on the analog, on the analog mixing desk would do, right? But you can see those here as well which is why it's cool. And, and all the sequencers have taken, up until recently, have taken the same paradigm uh, of the 24-track studio and the way that it works. And the reason that they did that was because it was what most audio engineers were used to and that they were the original customers of these things because 20, 25 years ago, Digital audio was very expensive. For, let me just tell you, for example, uh, my first four, uh, no, I think I had a four, I had a 768 megabyte hard drive on a SCSI thing. Um, that was, that cost me like over $1,000. And my first, I think it was either two or four gigabyte hard drive it cost me over $1,000, right? Like the cost of my phone, which has like 128 gigs in it, but a whole phone. Just think about that. You've got like a little portable computer right here that you can do any, like all sorts of amazing things with. A four gigabyte hard drive in the late 1990s, that's how much that cost. So you could see that once, you know, and there were limitations 
in terms of the hardware that you could use. And back then, basically, it was only a few pieces of software that could record more than uh, a few tracks at a time, which Pro Tools was one of them, and uh, Sound Tools, which was a precursor to Pro Tools, I believe. Um, and things started progressing from there. But so, so what I'm saying is that back in the day, the customers were people in high-end recording studios, not consumers with laptops. So they wanted to make it as easy as possible for engineers to want to switch to this new medium. So they followed as closely as they could the, the, the recording studio paradigm. And basically, with software like Logic, Pro Tools, um, Cubase, you have a, a 24 track, you have a multi track studio inside of your computer, and all you need is an interface and a microphone to be, and headphones or good monitoring speakers to have a really good uh, recording situation in your laptop. Um, now, there are other, uh, other, other ways of using computer uh, DAWs and like Ableton is based on a loop paradigm. It's much different. It's to wrap your head around it and it's really great for live performance. Um, it, it'll be interesting to see if as time goes on whether this particular formula is followed and developed further or whether you know new, new ways of working overtake this stuff and make this uh, sort of obsolete. Uh, only time will tell, right? I don't really know the answer to that. So, um, yeah, let's see. Was there anything else I wanted to talk about today? Well, you know what? We do have a little more time. Hey, Pete, I had a question. Yes, Andrew. C can you take an audio file and do what you did with um, Expand and Boom and play with the attack, the release, the decay? Um, yes, you can. Um, yep. But what you can also do is you can program it into a sampler where you can very easily do that. But you can, you can change the attack and the decay by automating the volume on an audio track. You can sort of simulate that. But that's different because you're not playing it from a keyboard. You're just sort of... Um... Oh, we're, oh, here we go. Okay. I found what I was looking for. So I wanted to show you, um, a f I found this photo the other day. This isn't my current setup, but these are some of the studios I've had since 2000, since about 2000. So this one right here, let me zoom in on that. So this, these top two were in this, Ken was right across the hall from me uh, in this. This is my Power Max 7500 right here. And then here were my rack of samplers. I had a bunch of uh Roland S760s, and these are these right here are Kurzweil samplers, and I had, you know, my master keyboard, and then um, my audio interface, which was right down here, and then I had a couple of other keyboards, uh, and then this was my next iteration, right? You could see I've got more computer screens because I was using this right here. I had this thing called a Giga Studio, which was hooked up to. Um, I controlled it from my Mac, and it, it was a high, it was on a PC, and it had a high end sampler inside of it that I used to score films with. It was really great, and then I bought a proper desk with bigger speakers on top, and I had like a soundproof rack over here, and then I moved out of that studio back into my Upper East Side apartment, and then I had a very tight little setup right here, with um, I think I had a G5 Mac with two screens, and then I had an iMac here which I ran this software called Vienna Ensemble on instead of Giga Studio. And I think I had a couple of iMacs. And I see I was working in Pro Tools back then. And then this here, my wife and I had a, a house up in the Catskills for 10 years before uh, that we used to go to. And I built, built out this studio here, right? And this is just a very simple project studio. And then on the bottom here, this was my Upper West Side apartment, um, my older setup. But you could see it's it's very similar, all of them. I've got my keyboard, I've got my desk, I've got my screens in front of me, I've got my monitors at ear level, my speaker monitors. I have more than one screen uh, so I could watch a film. And then I've got, you know, stuff here. Yeah, 
and this was off. This was in my living room, my apartment, and I did a lot of work there, and I got sound treatment all up on the stuff. Actually, I believe Ken came over there a few times and mixed stuff for me. Um, all right, so there's only one other thing I want to talk about today, and um, I want to show a picture. <laughs> So yesterday was uh, the 11th of April, uh, 2021, and that's me on April 11th, 1991, 30 years ago yesterday. That was the opening night of Miss Saigon on Broadway, and I was the principal keyboard player of the show. I was there for 10 years, and uh, I think my sister, my, one of my older sisters or my mother took that picture because they came to opening night, and... Uh, yeah, there you go. A bit of history. This is my dear friend who's no longer alive, Tim Malash, unbelievable flute player. This guy right here is Lino Gomez. He plays bass, all the clarinets and class and saxophones, and he plays with the New York Philharmonic when they need a saxophone player. He's the guy they call. Um, and this is the bassoon player, Braden Tone. And this is the oboist, oboist Blair Tyndall, who became notorious for writing the book Mozart in the Jungle, which some of you may have heard, which became an Amazon series. And yeah, there you go. 30 years ago yesterday, I was young. <laughs> you know, I did, I, when I got hired from that gig, the show was not great. It ran for a long time. The cast was unbelievable. The band was amazing. The orchestra. I couldn't believe that I was playing in the orchestra. But, you know, I got hired for that gig. There were hundreds of keyboard players that wanted to be hired for that gig, but I was the one who got hired. And I can tell you exactly why I got hired. Because I was the right person with the right skill set in the right place at the right time. Right? So what do I mean by the right person? Well, I was somebody who had experience. Um, I was somebody who all the people in hiring positions knew who I was and had hired me for other things before. So what do I mean by that? Okay, so the conductor of this show was a man named Bob Billig. I met Bob Billig in 1982 when I started subbing at Little Shop of Horrors off Broadway. He was the original pianist and conductor there. And I subbed on the synthesizer, uh, the electric keyboard book, which was Fender Rhodes, organ, and Poly 6. And Bob was playing piano and conducting, and I came in, and I did a great job subbing on that keyboard book. So much so that after eight months of subbing there, the, the, the keyboard player at that time, uh, Robbie Merkin, he was leaving because he was getting busy as an orchestrator, and Bob hired me to take over. And then Bob, in the summer of 1984 got hired to be the conductor at Radio City Music Hall for the summer show. And they needed a keyboard player with a DX7, which I had, uh, to be in the pit. Bob hired me to, to, to do that. So I spent a whole summer, 13 weeks, playing in the Radio City Music Hall Orchestra, two, two shows with you know 45-piece orchestra. An amazing experience. I'll tell you, there's it, nothing like being on the band car having it come up out of the garage and then like you're playing as the car is moving around on the stage with the Rockettes dancing. And uh, yeah, that was, that was an amazing experience for a young, young musician. And then Bob became the music director and the conductor for Les Miserables. And he hired me to go play Les Miserables, the first national tour for six months in Boston in 1990. And then there was another music supervisor. So Bob was the conductor and music supervisor uh, of Miss Saigon. And then there was a second music supervisor, a guy named David Caddick. Well, David Caddick is, was a, an English conductor. He's a great musician. He was the uh, uh, original conductor for Fan of the Opera on Broadway, and I subbed there, and he liked my playing, and he liked me personally. And there was a tour that was going out called The Music of Andrew Lloyd Webber in Concert, and the contractor of that show, of that tour, was named Mel Rodman, and in the late 80s, Mel Rodman was the contractor of, uh, of, like, he had, like, at one point, like, 25 bands that he had contracted out between shows on Broadway and touring shows. 
at the same time. And they were looking for keyboard players to go out on this tour, and David Caddick recommended me. So I met Mel, and Mel was the contractor for Miss Saigon. So, and then additionally, the concert mistress for Miss Saigon was a woman named Luann Montesi. And Luann was a fantastic violinist, and she must be in her 80s now. But I met Luann when I was a very young working keyboard player because she was the concert mistress at Radio City Music Hall when I did the summer show there. And she was the concert mistress at Fan of the Opera when I was subbing there. Right? So all that stuff happened, and they needed somebody who could play in a rhythm section, who could play in an orchestra, who could accompany singers. Well, I'd shown all these people that I could do all these things. They needed somebody who could read music and play like orchestral piano, but they also needed somebody who could look at what was written by the orchestrator, Bill Braun, for the rhythm section parts and make them sound authentic, which I could do, right? So all those things sort of happened at the same time and led to me getting hired to the show. And it was a really difficult gig because the whole show was written around the keyboard book. And even if you couldn't hear it, it was so there, I had pages that had like 512 notes on it, just steady streams of 16th notes in both hands. You know, like this uh, systems music, Philip Wright kind of stuff that really just was driving the show and pushing it forward. And then there were moments where there were very quiet, soft ballads. I, I have on my YouTube page the 1991 Tony Awards where I'm playing on them. Uh, you can hear the electric keyboards very distinctly on that. And... Um, and then there is, from the last month of the run, somebody snuck a VHS camera in, and you can the, show, I, the orchestra still sounds great. They captured Leia Salonga, who was the star. And she came in for the last month to close the show, or well, the last couple of months, to boost attendance and help close the show out. Um, but, you know, you could still hear the band sounded great, even 10 years later, and uh, the cast was unbelievable. People, there were like 18, 19, 20-year-old kids in that, you know, and I'm friends with them still, uh, you know, on Facebook, and they've all got families and kids now, and it's just been an amazing, it was an amazing situation. It was really hard work uh, because it was like playing a, like a, a piano concerto every night, and it was very loud, and the story was really depressing. I mean, she, it was basically Madame, Puccini, uh, Madame Butterfly by Puccini, and she killed herself in the end, right? So it's a, it's a very depressing story. Um, and in order to make it work, because the, because the material wasn't as good as... The guys that did it did Les Miserables, which has great material. Miss Saigon has some great moments, but it's got some moments that are not quite as well-developed as Les Mis was. And in order to make it work, you had to sort of almost be hyper-emotional and like really push and just over-exert yourself to make it work. And that got, got to be really tiring. After the show closed, I didn't touch a piano for four months. Um, yeah, I, 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 could, I wouldn't, couldn't even be bothered looking at one. It was really, ugh. So anyway, that was 30 years ago yesterday. And, uh, you know, it, it, I'd worked before that, but that show sort of set up the rest of my life because I was able to come back to Queens College and get my master's degree uh, while I was working. And it gave me time during the day to get a computer and even though I had been doing hardware sequencing, you know, I, I had time to like work on my learning how, how to do computer sequencing in this program called Vision. And, you know, all the stuff I, 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 I then I, I got good at that. And I started getting work towards the end of the run doing television music, writing production music, and then getting short films to score, and then some feature films to score, and then writing theme songs for sports programs, and then, you know, getting f documentaries to score, and just, you know, getting my writing career going. And, um, the other great part about it is I got 10 years of incredible pension donations into the AFM pension fund, which I'm, is funding my life partially now. And, uh, you know, uh, my point being, uh, I just want to talk for a few more minutes. There's about working in the industry, right? And I've talked about this with some of you have heard this before, is that to work in the industry... You have to create something to, 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 in any industry. You have to create something of value and find the right place in the marketplace for it, right? So for me, you know, writing music for films and television, that's, what I, that's the thing I do the best out of everything. But when I was this age, my, what I had that was unique was the ability to play piano 
in a large ensemble, follow a conductor, follow a, and accompany a singer, drive a rhythm section, and play uh, like have no problem playing uh, like being the only person playing in front of 1800 people every night right um i had all those skills and i got the marketplace was the people that could hire me to play in this show and meeting all those people was getting my skills out into that marketplace right so the concept has stayed the same but the marketplace changes Right. And you develop new skills to get at the marketplace so that when you guys that are graduate students and you, you want to go out into the world and be musicians. Um, you're going to have to look and see what skills you have and what where that can fit into the marketplace, because the world is a very different place now than it was then. Right. You know. I don't even know if Pro Tools was invented then, right? Um, there was no streaming then of audio. Like if people were selling CDs for, you know, they were making their living selling CDs. You had all these uh, groups from the 60s and 70s that were still living off of royalties from their album sales, which all changed when, uh, when iTunes came along, right? And streaming started happening. So... Yeah, it's it's just interesting. Thirty years that passed by like in the blink of an eye. Yeah, that's right, Paul. You know, nobody. I don't think anybody reasonable expects you to be perfect when you get hired for these jobs at every moment. But they expect you to work hard and to show, be earnest, and to be really, um, you know, just to, to 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 pay attention and work hard, right? Because I certainly, you know, I was playing a tune once one night. I remember very clearly. And the tune is like it starts. It's a last night of the world, and it's a measure. Of, yeah, it's a it's a measure of broken arpeggios. B to B augmented to B to B augmented, and then um, it goes to the four chord to E, then to like E over F sharp, like a an eleven five eleven chord, right? And I went to the four chord two bars too early because I I, I dropped two bars off the intro. I, I did I did that, and I'm the only one playing. Everybody's laughing at me. You know, it was really embarrassing. I, I, I fixed it, sort of. I mean, I got back on. But, you know, it's like, but I was earnest, and that didn't happen often. But it, it does happen. You do make mistakes. Nobody's perfect, you know. So anyway, that's a story at the end of the day. I hope that was uh, interesting to you all. Yeah. Any questions on any of this? So um, nothing... So you have the audio editing is due next week. And then what I would do if I was all, if I were you guys is I would take a listen to that audio material, download it and take a listen to all the remix stuff and just start thinking of like what you'd like to maybe possibly start working on. And then we'll get into more techniques inside of Pro Tools next week. Uh, yeah. And that's it for today. That's all she wrote, folks. Great, Pete. Thanks. No, thank, thank you. you, Ken. Really Ken. appreciate it, Ken. Appreciate Little hand for Ken. Yeah. Thanks, Ken. Thanks, Ken. Thanks, Thanks you, Ken. Guys. Yeah, he put a lot Thanks. of time into researching that. It's really that was good. awesome. Very cool cool slides. All right, I'll catch you guys next week. Have a great, have a great day, everyone. Thanks, Pete. Thank you.